Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this conference on a presidential election during the time of COVID-19. Uh, this is our third annual, but first virtual conference of the Baker Institute's presidential elections program. While I wish that we were able to welcome you into Baker Hall in person, as we have in past years, I'm glad that we can conduct this important event remotely. As we are all more than aware, 2020 has been a game-changing year in countless ways. The COVID-19 pandemic has altered not only our daily lives, but has also had immense implications for the conduct of our political system with the obvious repercussions to our economy. I do not believe it is an overstatement to say that we are a deeply divided nation today. With this year's presidential elections, we have witnessed a lack of trust in political institutions and heightened polarization within our populace. This has all been coupled with the procedural and logistical challenges the COVID-19 pandemic has posed to our election processes. So amidst these circumstances, Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy recognizes the importance of its mission to be a nonpartisan platform for thoughtful dialogue and data-driven research surrounding the most pressing policy issues we face today. The idea to create the presidential elections program came from our honorary chair, Secretary James A. Baker III, who having managed five presidential campaigns himself, thought it important to develop a nonpartisan resource to study presidential elections, especially given the experience of 2016. And that's indeed what we're doing uh, at this week's program. Beyond the presidential <clears throat> elections program, uh, our other centers and programs have been recognized as top resources for decision makers on the local, national, and global level. In 2019, the Baker Institute was ranked the second most prominent university affiliated think tank in the world. And our Center for Energy Studies is rated the top energy and resource policy think tank globally. This conference, which <clears throat> will take place over the next three days in different sessions via Zoom, will feature unique and timely discussions among leading academics, journalists, and experts in the practice of politics. Ultimately, the presidential elections program is a valuable asset to the National Study of American Politics. And I'm confident that this week's conference <clears throat> will be engaging and will be uh, enlightening uh, to all of us to give us clarity on the turbulent political events of the present day. I'm very grateful to our fellows, Mark Jones and John Williams, and to the conference's co-chairs, Stephanie Cutter and Beth Myers for their work uh, to bring this event to fruition, as well as to our Baker Institute staff and roundtable members who make events such as this possible. So allow me now to welcome John Williams to introduce our first panel, which will be a discussion on what happened with the polls in 2020. John. Thank you, Ambassador, for welcoming us to the presidential elections program. And thanks as well for all you do to make the Baker Institute a bridge between the world of ideas in the world of action. Your work here is exemplary. I'm John Williams, director of the pro co-director of the program. And just about like everything else in 2020, from the recent elections to grocery shopping, the deadly pandemic has disrupted our program, which we moved from Baker Hall at Rice University into the internet. And so the title of this year's program, a presidential election during the time of COVID-19 is particularly appropriate. Our program will run today, tomorrow, and Thursday, starting at 11 each a.m. Central Time each day. Each day we'll have two panels who will discuss the election, the aftermath, and perhaps the most unique election in U.S. history. We have a good show planned, and I suspect that anyone even remotely interested in the 2020 presidential election will find it enlightening as well as entertaining. But before introducing our first panel, I want to recognize Ambassador Pete Conway, who passed away last month. As U.S. Ambassador to Switzerland Liechtenstein from 2006 to 2008, Ambassador Conway was later a stalwart on the Institute's Board of Advisors, and his support of this program has been critical to any success that we have achieved. God bless you, Mr. Ambassador, 
and thanks for all you have done for our nation, as well as for the Baker Institute. I got a little lost, I apologize. The title of our first panel is What Happened with the Polls in 2020? For the second presidential election in a row, opinion polling was way off. So far off, in fact, that Secretary Baker recently wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal comparing opinion pollsters to Lucy and the cartoon strip Peanuts. Ahead of the presidential elections of 2016 and 2020, he wrote, pollsters held the political football in place to tee up certain Democratic victories. But at the last second, the ball was pulled away and the entire country landed flat on its back when the Republican candidate fared much better than expected. Today, nationally recognized polling experts will discuss where most of the polls were off and explain the principal reasons behind the divergence from the actual results. Our panelists are Lana Atkinson, a professor and regents lecturer at the, in the Department of Political Science at the University of New Mexico, where she also serves as the director of the Center for the Study of Voting, Elections, and Democracy. Kenneth Goldstein, professor of politics at the University of San Francisco and faculty director of the USF and DC program. Darren Shaw, professor of government at the University of Texas at Austin, who is also co-director of the Fox News poll and of the University of Texas, Texas Tribune poll. Today's panel will be moderated by Mark Jones, my co-director of the presidential elections program and the political science fellow at the Baker Institute. Mark, it's now your show. Hey, well, thank you, John, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is clearly a topic that's of great interest to those of us in the academic world, as well as those in the political world and the media world. That is the polls, something we rely on and something which have become crucial for our understanding of how the electorate behaves, but only when perhaps they get it right. And this election polls once again, uh, as happened in 2016, we're off. And so what we're going to talk about today, first in three presentations, and then the question and answer period is what happened, why, and what we can do about it. And so I'd encourage you as the panelists are uh, presenting, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A and we'll hopefully get, be able to get to as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. So right now I'll turn it on over to Lana who will lead us off with her presentation, followed by Darren and then Ken. Uh, Lana, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here today to talk about election polling. I'm gonna just share my screen here. Um, Uh-oh, let's see. Sorry for the slow here. I'm having a slideshow um, problem. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's see, I cannot get, there we go. All right. Um, my sharing has failed. I can't share anything. It won't let me share. It, can you help me with this? I, it, it just says I'm not allowed to share. Um, no. <laughs> try again, Lana. Okay, try again. Okay, let me, I'll just, uh, uh, shoot. Now I'm... <clears throat> All right. Okay, trying again. <laughs> um, uh, Darren, do you want to get, you want to try to start off? Yeah, sure. Let's see if uh, let's see if I can get my screen share going. How's that look, everybody? That looks good. All right. Yeah, let me fire this up. Uh, I'm Darren Shaw from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I do uh, polls for uh, Fox News. I also do the University of Texas poll, as was uh, mentioned in the intro. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a brief presentation today uh, with a lot of data, which I'm happy to make available to anybody who is interested. Um, about uh, polling in the last election cycle. So let me go ahead and uh, start here and see if I can okay. get you a Okay, okay, whoa, okay, all right. I'm so sorry. 
Um, I'm sorry, did you start and I didn't know? Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. You want to just flip flop, let all go and then you go? Yes, yes. Sorry about all that. I have not ever had that happen before. <laughs> no, man, you can you can dive bomb this presentation whenever you want. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to oblige. Okay, so uh, let me get this going here. Um, first, I'm, I'm going to borrow here from uh, my colleague at the University of Texas, Chris Blasian, uh, who's written some terrific stuff with, uh, with Bob Erickson uh, from the University of Houston. Uh, on uh, the timeline of presidential elections. And one of the central points that, uh, that Chris and Bob make in their research is that, uh, as you might expect, polling becomes more accurate the closer you get to the election. And so what I'm presenting here are data uh, taken from uh, historical uh, sources. And so we're talking about uh, really hundreds of polls over dozens of presidential election cycles where these dots indicate singular poll results. And what you're getting here is uh, the extent to which they're off from the actual results uh, by how far out they're conducted. And so as you see, you talk about 300 days out, 250, 200 days out, you get fairly significant errors, but those errors tend to be reduced and tend to be reduced fairly significantly um, as you get closer to the election cycle, so, uh, or to the actual election day. So what, uh, what Blazing and Erickson show is about, on average, about a point and a half error is typical in presidential elections by the time you get to those polls conducted just a day or two before the election. So that's kind of the historical benchmark. Let's take a look at, uh, as was mentioned uh, earlier, the, the 2016 polls compared to other election cycles. What I've got here is the Democratic advantage shown by the national polls. Okay, so again, we don't actually have a national election in the United States. Uh, we have a series of statewide elections, but these are taken from national polls, which ask people how they intend to vote. What you've got is the national polling average compared to the election result. And the far column is the one I'd like to draw your attention to, and that's the absolute error. All right, so we're not talking about the direction, just how far off on average each poll is compared to the actual result. And you can see there are some doozies here. Uh, the the, the all-time champion for misprediction was 1980's election, uh, in which, uh, as you see, the, the national poll average was uh, Reagan by about two and a half points. Uh, and the actual result was Reagan by close to 10 points. So you've got a, an error of about seven uh, plus percentage points. Uh, 1996 and 2000, there were fairly significant errors. Uh, interestingly though, if, if you look at the actual data from 2016, at the national level, you know, the, uh, the, the polling average actually wasn't that far off. Um, you know, the average was about 2.1 uh, percentage points of error. Um, that's off. It's you know just slightly above the average, but actually the errors in 2012 were more significant than they were in 2016. Now I'm not going to sit here and, and defend the polls in 2016, uh, particularly the polls in the upper Midwest states, which is really what we're talking about. You know, being surprised to shocked by Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. But if you're looking at the national polls. We had a little bit of an issue in 2016, but I, I think the extent to which the polls were just disastrous in 2016 is, is slightly, I don't wanna say overstated. I wanna say it's a little misdirected. Um, the statewide polls in certain states were very far off. The national polls were slightly off. All right, so let's take a look at what we have here in 2020. So I, forgive me if your uh, stack of videos on the side sort of blocks this, but uh, what the, uh, the data are showing, this is taken from the Real Clear Politics average, in which the final result, and this is a few days old because we're still getting ballots from California and other places, Biden at 51.1%, Trump at 47.2, compared to the real clear politics average, which was 51.2 compared to 44.0. So what you see here is that the forecast error is about 3.3 percentage points. And you can also see, and I think this is consequential, we could talk about this later, uh, the polls were almost dead on with respect to Biden, right? 51.2%, he actually polls 51.1%. Where the polls were off is in underestimating Donald Trump's points. So he's at 47.2. The polls have him at 44.0. And we could talk about you know, the nature of undecideds and the collapse of kind of minimal third party support and how that affected this contest. But we can also talk about why it is that the polls seem to systematically underestimate support for Donald Trump. Okay? But that's a little bit of historical context. If we plug the 2020 numbers from the national polls into uh, the historical averages, we see again, the national polling average was uh, was Biden by about seven points. He ends up uh, winning by about four points. So the air term is 3.3. Now, so this isn't an all time champ. It's not like 1980, but it's about on par with the polling uh, misprediction that we saw in 1996 and 2000. That is about 3.3 points. Uh, 
So again, you also see it's the largest misprediction we've had uh, since 2000. So larger than 04, 08, 12, or 16. So the polls were off, no question about that. They were correct directionally, but not in terms of the magnitude of the Biden win. Let's take a look at the statewide polls here. And this I think shows the, uh, the effect or the, the tendency of misprediction in more dramatic relief. What you have here is every state, and what I've done is I've, I've taken the, uh, the misprediction, that is the extent to which one candidate or the other was understated by the polls. And I've rank ordered the states according to the misprediction. So what you see here, the red bars indicate that Trump was under forecast by the statewide polls. And the magnitude of that misprediction is what's shown by the bar. So interestingly, I think at the very top end, you've got uh, Trump was significantly understated in New York by over 15 points. I find kind of interesting. Uh, also understated in uh, North Dakota, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, uh, Montana. So you see that in these very, with the exception, of course, of New York, these very Trumpy states, Trump was dramatically under forecast, right? But you also see, and we'll show this more dramatically here in a minute too, the misprediction uh, and the understatement of Trump's support in the battleground states. You see towards the bottom end of this chart, Trump was, uh, or Biden was actually under forecast in a handful of states, Maryland, Colorado, California, Illinois, um, Louisiana, which is again, sort of an outlier here, the way New York is on the other side of the spectrum, and DC. But almost all, so we're talking about, I believe, let's see, six states under forecast Biden, essentially 45 states, um, you know, plus DC here, 45 states under forecast Trump. So the, the conventional wisdom that the polls were off and that they understated Trump is pretty undeniable. In the battleground states, here we have the actual margin in the burnt orange. Apologize for being a bit of a homer here. Um, and then the poll margin in the purple. Um, so again, the extent to which the actual margin here differs from the polling margin shows you the misprediction. Now what you've got on the far right is the average misprediction. That is to say that since the, the margin here is scored Biden minus Trump, 3.2 indicates that in the battleground states, uh, Biden was seen as uh, the favorite was uh, seen as up by, on average, across these states, about 3.2 points, when in fact, Trump ends up, this is an average across the states, Trump ends up uh, being preferred across these uh, battleground states. Uh, the magnitude, though, is is interesting. You see Wisconsin is, is kind of clearly an interesting outlier here, where uh, Biden's uh, advantage was about nine points in the polls, but he ends up winning by a point. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you see Iowa, uh, where, uh, you know, you had about a, 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 you know, less than a one point margin in the polls and Trump ends up winning by eight points. Ohio is somewhat similar. Uh, in none of these states do you see an overestimation of Biden's support. It's always an underestimation of Trump's support. Um, I should say an underestimation of Biden's support. It's always an underestimation of Trump. Two states, you actually see a flip. That is to say, the polls had one candidate winning and the other actually won. And those are Florida and North Carolina. All the other states are, are correct directionally, even if the magnitude is far off. This uh, second uh, actually shows the magnitude of misprediction across the battleground states. The largest areas in Wisconsin, Iowa, Ohio, also Florida and Michigan. The smallest areas in Georgia and Nevada and then Arizona. But they're all in the same direction, underestimating Trump. Uh, I'm going to whip through a few slides here that, uh, that take the last dozen or so polls conducted before the election and then plot them. Uh, where what you've got here, the zero point indicates the actual margin. So anything to the right indicates that Biden was over forecast. Anything to the left indicates that Trump was over forecast. And if you do this state by state, it gives you some leverage about how off the polls were individually and then in the aggregate. So you see in Arizona, you know, most of the polls kind of overrepresented Biden compared to Trump. Same in Nevada, but the air isn't enormous. It's there, but it's not enormous. So that's Arizona and Nevada. Let's move quickly to Florida and Georgia. In Georgia, you actually see some evidence that Trump was slightly over forecast across these polls. That's, that's indicated by those red bars. But Florida was a mess. Um, and this, by the way, is I, I think the third straight election in which we've significantly under forecast the Republican vote in Florida. So you see Emerson, Quinnipiac, uh, Reuters had this at a seven, eight, nine point race for Biden. And Trump, of course, ends up winning. Um, Trafalgar came out with a couple of polls that were closer, but even those polls showed uh, Biden with a slight advantage. Let's move to the upper Midwest. You see in Michigan and Wisconsin, not every poll was off, um, but there's significant 
overstatement of Biden's support, especially if you look at that Wisconsin data, those Wisconsin data. All right. And then again, let's stick in these interesting battleground states in the upper Midwest. Pennsylvania, the air in Pennsylvania may be a little overstated from with respect to the conventional wisdom. They were off, but you do see some polls that had an advantage for Trump. Um, you know, you see a lot of polls in that uh, two, uh, you know, three, two, or even with the Trump lead space. And the polls that are way off here, ABC, po ABC News, Washington Post, Monmouth, they show a six point Biden lead. They're off, but they're not, you know, enormously off. In Ohio, of course, just way off. Significant, significant errors. Ohio, they're all in the same direction. And you can see some of them, Quinnipiac, and my heart goes out to Quinnipiac, they did three of the last dozen polls and they showed leads of nine, 12, 13 points. They, they were far off for uh, Joe Biden. By the way, I, I, I mis misstated that. Those aren't the leads they were showing. That's the extent they were off from the actual result. So that's what we're looking at. How far were they off from the actual result? So red means they um, you know, overstated Trump. Blue means they overstated Biden. Carolina and Texas, um, once again, consistent overrepresentation of, uh, of Biden's uh, standing in the polls. So, you know, same story here. And then uh, I, I guess our, our champion here is Iowa, um, where the Des Moines Register and Ann Seltzer, who's got a, just a sterling reputation as a pollster, I think she further burnished that reputation in this cycle where uh, she was far and away the most accurate pollster, but even the Des Moines Register is slightly overstated Biden's support. Um, so massive polling error in Iowa, Minnesota, not so bad. So again, variation across the states. All right, let me conclude here. Um, Broadly speaking, errors were slightly larger than usual for these national polls. Um, kind of got it right with respect to Biden, not even close on Trump. And that's where all of the air term is, is really on stating, uh, estimating what Trump was going to get. Uh, significant variation, um, but it, it, with respect to the statewide polls, but obviously overstating Biden's, uh, Biden's marks, especially in Iowa, Florida, uh, Ohio. Um, and you actually had the incorrect winner predicted in North Carolina and Florida. Now, you could argue that, well, you know, basically the polls got it right in 48 out of 50 states. That's something that polling apologists would point out. Well, you know, that's true. I mean, you can pick the winner in the Super Bowl, you know, but if the, you know, you say they're going to win by 30 and they win by two, you know, hopefully that point spread is, is not working against you. I'm not sure how proud pollsters should be about this performance. And then let me part by just sort of uh, offering four explanations and we can pick this up in the Q&A or maybe Lana or Ken want to address these things. Uh, if you look at the literature and you look at the commentary, about the polls, there's four kind of broad explanations, and I've listed them here. Partisan non-response, that simply says that even with the corrections that were made after 2016, uh, it just seemed like we had a hard time reaching Republicans and conservative Republicans as a selection cycle. Democrats seem much more willing to do surveys. So this is the, you know, that there was a problem with the response rates and the asymmetries and who was willing to take a poll versus not. Um, there's a sort of a sub argument here that, well, you got enough Republicans, but it's the wrong kind of Republicans. You didn't get these Trump Republicans, which is what you needed. You've all probably heard of the shy Trump voter theory. Um, Republicans are unwilling to reveal their true preferences. There's not a lot of evidence for this, and we can talk about that. And, and one of the more interesting um, sort of uh, ways of exploring this is to take a look at the accuracy, the differential accuracy of online polls where you're more anonymous versus uh, the live interviewer calls where you have to interact with somebody. And the idea is that maybe the online polls would be more accurate because, you know, the anonymity would encourage Trump supporters to reveal their true preferences. There's not a lot of evidence for that, but it's certainly a theory. And then these twin explanations with respect to turnout. Um, one is that uh, the polls simply underestimated enthusiasm for Trump and therefore likely voter screens kept some of these Trump voters out. Um, we can discuss that. And then the second turnout effect is, is actually focuses on the Democrats, that we slightly overrepresented Democrats in our likely voter models. Um, part of it could be that it's, it's a pandemic effect that Democrats who thought they voted by mail made mistakes or their ballots weren't counted, and so they actually shouldn't have been in the pool. Or another pandemic-related response or explanation is that they simply didn't want to show up on election day because of fears of COVID. All right, so those are all explanations, and I, I look forward to talking more about these things as we move forward. So let me stop there and stop sharing, and hopefully uh, Lana has her presentation fired up and ready to go. Okay, thank you very much, Darren. Uh, Lana, uh, the floor is okay. now yours. All right, let's try again. Hopefully I won't have uh, similar issues. Okay, here we go. And play from the beginning. Okay.
Uh, again, thanks for being here. I'm excited to talk about election polling. My talk really goes into sort of some more detail that Darren presented. So I think they're uh, nicely related. Um, of course, the, the problem with polls is the difference between the actual vote percent and the estimated that the pollsters uh, you know, do in their polling. And um, you know, historically, we haven't really cared about this much until recently. There's always been these differences and pretty much we've sort of looked at this like, well, did they predict the winner? And in 2016, of course, they didn't predict the winner, uh, at least of the Electoral College. And so we've spent more time thinking about now the actual difference between the estimates and the actual vote. And we're sort of considering more what the implications of are, but they've been around for uh, quite a while. As Darren pointed out, um, looking at the RCP, the Real, Real Clear Politics average, uh, there was this bias towards Democrats, 7% in Real Clear Politics, 8% in 538. Um, and in the end, we can say that the polls were off about seven, uh, uh, about uh, three or four points. Uh, they were right when they got Biden. They got Biden really close, just you know about 51 percent. But they really didn't predict Trump well. Uh, they predicted him to get you know three or four points less than he did. Um, um, so you know, if we look at this historically over the last 20 years, uh, we can sort of see that on average that four percent is about where we've been over time. And again, if we were to look at the accuracy of the polls in terms of just winners and losers, we would look at today's election and say, well, they got 48 out of 50 states right. They got the Electoral College right. So they're doing pretty well. But this sort of systematic error of, of you know, supporting Democrats and more than Republicans over time is, is, is a little bit, you know, disturbing um, and, you know, may have normative implications about whether or not people turn out, um, how we view uh, what the polls are telling us and in, in other areas. And so there are normative issues surrounding this that are, are, are particularly important. Uh, as Darren pointed out, there are four possible reasons for the error. The likely voter problem is one, shy respondents, uh, late deciders, or a non-response problem. Um, and so the likely voter problem is really a, a problem of who will turn out and, you know, Social science rarely has the opportunity to say, well, how good are our predictions? And election polling is one place where we can actually do this, but it's very difficult because we don't know who's going to turn out. You know, this, you know, if we just think about demographics over in the right corner here of this slide, uh, you know, we can, you know, if we play with, you know, what percentage of the whites versus the Latinos versus blacks are going to actually turn out and how they vote, that really affects the outcomes. So if it's very hard to get the likely likely voter model right. And uh, so likely voters are a subset of the actual population of citizens, but um, they have different characteristics in the total population. They're not a perfect subset, right? They're, there's a particular subset. And so if we get that wrong, we're going to get the results wrong. This was a big problem in 2016 when uh, polls underestimated turnout for white high school graduates. Um, and so this could be a really big problem this year. We had over 153 million voters, and it could be that we just didn't get this, you know, likely voter uh, numbers correct. And that's the underlying problem with our polls. And, you know, if that's the case, and, and certainly there's some evidence for this, here are two um, um, exit polls, and they both are providing very, very different uh, marginals in terms of how different groups are voting. The AP vote cast, for example, says 74% of the voters were white versus 65% uh, in the Edison um, in the Edison polls uh, on uh, after on election day. So they, there's some evidence that there could be a likely voter problem. Um, importantly, if this is the problem, then it's not a problem for polls generally, because it's hard to get who's going to be actually in the electorate, but it's really not as hard to figure out what the, the electorate or the citizens look like generally, right? Not thinking about likely voters. So in that case, polls aren't having problems generally, just election polls. And so, you know, I'd feel a lot, a little better about um, things if that were the case. Uh, shy Trump voters, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because uh, Darren did a really good job talking about this. There are not a lot of evidence to support this. Post-election polls looking at uh, shy Trump voters, uh, you know, can't really find any. Um, so, 
there's there's just not a lot of support for shy Trump voters. But if there were Trump, Trump, shy Trump voters, again, that wouldn't implicate polling more generally um, because that would just have to do with sort of a, a, a Trump effect. Um, it also could be late deciders. This was another problem in the 2016 election. We did see late deciders in, 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 some ex, in one exit poll um, and, in other, and some other polls that shows that they went more heavily for Trump, 60 or 40. But then other post-election analysis where we went back and we contacted people who were late deciders, they pretty much split equally and a bunch of them went to third party candidates. And there aren't very many uh, late deciders in this election compared to the last election, given it's an, you know, not an open race. Um, and, and so this also seems like an unlikely uh, reason. Um, to me, non-response seems to me the, the most likely uh, reason for what we, we see, and it's a really, really disturbing one. Non-response is a, is a failure to interview some subset of the population, and that leads to selection bias. We have these people in our sample frame, we have these people in our sample, but they refuse to respond to our surveys. And so our, our survey is not covering all the people that we need to cover. And the partisan non-response theory is that Democratic voters uh, you know, were, were maybe harder to reach or more just more willing uh, to respond to survey than Republicans. That's sort of the general um, feeling. And the way we usually get around this problem is we just wait. We wait uh, Republican voters to be, uh, you know, more in our survey and, and we can solve that problem. As long as it's just a general missing like missingness like that, that's a technique that should work perfectly. But it could be something more specific, not about Republican voters generally, but maybe about a specific group of Republican uh, voters. So one possible corollary, corollary of this theory is that Republicans widespread distrust in institution, such as mainstream media, which is liberal, and universities, which are also seen as liberal, um, that they just, you know, refuse to respond to these institutions that they don't trust. And so it's a specific segment of GOP voters who don't want to participate in the polls. And that's a bigger problem for um, our results. There is evidence of non-response error, uh, of non-response errors in our surveys. I have been doing surveys since 2006. And in 2016, I started receiving handwritten letters, um, emails, um, phone calls, you know, basically telling me that I was a huge problem, that I was brainwashing students, and that, that there's no way they were going to help me participate in those processes. Um, I continued to getting those kinds of emails and letters um, in 2018 and in 2020. This did not happen prior to 2016. I had many Republicans responding in my polls. Um, you know, I was able to predict the election well with very little waiting early on. Um, but as time has progressed, this has changed. And I can see in my data and in my sample that I'm having a harder time reaching Republicans and I'm having to, uh, you know, sample, sort of oversample them to get them up to, their, to where they should be. Um, here's just a sampling of a bunch of things people have emailed me in 2020. I wish I could put one of the handwritten notes, but I can't get into my office at the moment because of COVID to get those. So I just took the emails. Um, which aren't quite as pretty as the handwritten notes, but they say things like, take me off your mailing list. I don't want to participate in any of your, you know, bull crap. And I will not take part in the survey, but I will tell you that the only way to improve the Democratic Party is to abolish it completely. Stop cheating. Thank you and have a good day. Trump 2020. How did you know I voted? My vote is supposed to be secret. The 2020 election was tampered with to allow liberal socialist democratic candidates take, to take over this country. And of course, uh, my favorite at the bottom, you know, blank off you liberal blank. Um, so I, I also get emails from, you know, people on the left and from liberals, but they don't have this distrust of me. And this is what I've really noticed in these emails, how much distrust. And so the theory about a particular group of Republicans not wanting to participate um, seems uh, more likely to me. If this is true, I think this is a much more serious problem for the, the polling industry. If something like you know, your social trust or your interest uh, 
um, in a survey, say, you know, is related to your willingness to participate, then we have a serious non-response problem that leads to implications in and problems in our surveys, problems with our point estimates, problems with, you know, our, our results. What we're presenting is, you know, a few points uh, in the wrong direction and is, is more troubling. It's definitely um, a more, um, you know, sort of leftist uh, view of the world that we're seeing in surveys potentially. Um, so pollsters spent a great deal of time, you know, doing state polls in this election year, attempting to make sure they didn't have any of the same problems they had in 2016. They tried to correct all of those, but the fact that they didn't, especially with all of that effort, is particularly worrisome. The long-term bias that we've seen uh, in favor of Democrats suggests that there is this more, you know, serious problems in the polls, that there are perhaps house effects um, that lead these groups or these institutions um, to have results that are uh, slightly uh, more left-leaning. And that's all I got. And um, I'm going to stop sharing and kick it off to the next person. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lana. And so, uh, Bring up the anchor like you, Ken Goldstein. Uh, take it away, Ken. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. It's uh, it's good to be back at the Baker Baker Institute. I think I was there uh, uh, a year and a half ago at a at, at a similar sort of sort of presentation. Um, so I feel like a little bit of like the weak link. You said I was the whatever the uh, the batting cleanup here, but the weak link in the group project. Uh, as any of you are professors know, students or even your kids always hate group projects. So I get to be the weak kid and take advantage of these uh, excellent PowerPoints that uh, that Darren and Lana did to set it up. So I'm gonna I'm gonna play without a net a little bit. Um, and uh, let me just share a couple a couple thoughts and a couple of those thoughts riffing off some of the things that Lana and uh, and Darren said. Um, I think none of us um, are are apologists for what uh, what the state of modern polling is. Um, there clearly is there clearly is a, a problem. Um, I think it is tempting, and I think uh, many people said this in 2016 that you just had a couple problems in a couple states. And if you look at the average um, in 2016, it wasn't even off that much. And I think if you look at Darren's numbers, I actually think it's even a little bit a little bit closer because um, as the vote came in, uh, I think Hillary Clinton's national vote grew a little bit more from uh, from 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 0.6. So it's easy to say, hey, you know, the national polls weren't off that much in uh, in, in in 2016. Um, but I really do think it is a uh, I really do think it is a problem. Uh, four is a lot, um, and also Darren talked a little bit about the absolute value um, for the national polls. We don't need to talk about the absolute value because all the polls were off in the direction of Biden. There was a there was a uniform skew. So you can have error in a particular year, but you may be less concerned about that error if there's some error that overstates one party and, and then other error that understates another party. But all of the error was consistent in, uh, in, in one direction and virtually consistent in one direction at the, at the state level. Um, as Darren was showing the, showing the historical, uh, historical data as well, um, you know, I got to thinking, so on the one hand, um, uh, for those saying, hey, it's not so bad, you can say that the polling this year wasn't as bad as previous years and certainly wasn't as bad as that, uh, that very bad miss in, um, in 1980. Um, but that's sort of interesting is, you know, think about, you know, folks of you who might be in various industries, whether it's the oil industry or, or, or you're in medicine or you're in, uh, in the space industry in, in Houston, um, it's usually the case in science that, uh, Measures and uh, measures and machines um, should improve in precision, um, and it's interesting to see that polling, uh, if anything, has uh, has gotten worse over over time. Um, another interesting thing to, to to point out, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this. When we are calculating the the error, um, it depends on what the actual uh, result was. Um, and as uh, California and New York still count their votes, we're still uh, we're still going to get a little bit more Biden margin in the in the national vote. But um, I think both uh, both Lana and Darren were using the real clear politics average, which is basically a simple average of I can't exactly remember their 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 methodology of the last five or six polls that were done. 
and doesn't try and do any other um, statistical wizardry to those, to those polls. Um, and what makes it the 7.2 or the under or the under eight for the national margin and not a higher margin is because real clear politics includes a lot of polls that all the cool nerdy kids, and I know that's an oxymoron, but all the pollsters um, who, uh, um, uh, or and even media organizations that decide which polls are airworthy would not include many of the polls that real clear politics. So real clear politics philosophy is just put in every poll, don't make a decision about the, about the quality of the poll. And what shrinks the Biden margin is the inclusion of a lot of non-probability polls and a lot of partisan polls that typically would not be, uh, would not be trusted by most academics and not trusted by most, uh, by most news organizations. Um, and when you look at the last three traditional probability, um, I, 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 work for, I work for ABC News. Um, I did not do the state polls, so the, the Wisconsin poll was not mine. Um, uh, and like other, like other news organizations, we, um, we decide which polls are, are airworthy. And so the NBC News poll, um, the Quinnipiac poll, um, and the Fox News poll, Darren's poll, are all airworthy polls for ABC using, um, using um, strong traditional probability phone, phone methods. And the NBC, last NBC Wall Street Journal poll was 10, the last Quinnipiac poll was 11, and the last Fox poll was eight. So when you actually look at the higher quality polls, um, the, uh, the difference between um, uh, uh, Biden's uh, poll result and actual result was even higher. Um, and at the state level, as, as both Lana and Darren showed, it's even worse. There's some variance, but um, in, in most states and in all the states that matter, um, Biden's, um, Biden's, uh, Biden's, uh, Biden's uh, number, Biden's margin, was, uh, was overstated. And it's again the case that those numbers would have been even worse if you did not include polls that many political scientists, social scientists, statisticians, media folks don't consider trustworthy, which are non-probability partisan, um, partisan polls. So the irony is that uh, the polls that the nerds scoff at actually made the polling averages closer in um, in some of those in some of those states, um, and it's not only the um, media polls that were that were off. Obviously, um, Republicans and Democrats are doing lots of internal polling, um, and the Democratic polling was significantly off, and the Republican polling was significantly uh, off, both at the presidential level and in uh, a number of uh, in a number of House races. Um, uh, like others on here, my great, uh, my great connections in life are former students, and I have former students working for Dems, working for Republicans, so I was fortunate enough to get some interesting internal, internal briefings, and um, the, polling, the polling picture was uniform, whether you were talking to a Democratic pollster, a Republican pollster, a Republican wizard using the voter file, or a Democratic wizard doing the, um, doing the voter file. Um, and so you also saw the handicappers or, um, or the modelers, which could either be a Nate Cohen or a Nate Silver or, uh, or, or something like the Cook Political Report, also significantly getting, um, uh, clearly underestimating the Republicans' chances in Senate races and absolutely unequivocally and massively uh, overestimating Democratic chances in House races and overestimating uh, 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 underestimating Republican chances in House races and overestimating Democratic chances in House races. And one of the interesting things about the um, about the modelers, and uh, I think Darren mentioned a, a point spread in a in, in a football game. Listen, if you're if you're calling races toss up, or if you're giving probability assessments of where a race can go. Um, one of the good things about that is you can never be wrong, right? Because you can always say, well, there was a 10% chance that that uh, that the other outcome would would happen, and as I and and uh, and I said that in my in my model. But when you look at, at a prominent house forecaster who had 27 races identified as toss-ups, and all 27 went for Republicans, that suggests to you that all of those races were not actually were not actually toss-ups. 
Um, and though I think they use other sorts of information, clearly the main information that's driving, whether it's a Nate Cohen, a Nate Silver, a Cook political report is, um, is state, level, state level polling. So, um, so what happened? Um, listen, we are, we are absolutely speculating here. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very simple in how I look at uh, analyzing politics or when I do a poll, that uh, getting a poll right is about getting share and performance right. And, um, and, uh, and Lana talked about this as well when she was talking about the composition of the electorate, either ethnically or the composition of the electorate that differed pretty significantly by the two, uh, by the two, uh, um, by the two exit, exit polls. So when you're doing a poll, what you're trying to do is get the proportion by age, by, uh, by race, by race and education, correct. Um, and then how each, how, how each party or each candidate is performing within, within that group. Um, and I think this is something we, we talked about the last time I was, at, uh, I was at the Baker Institute at Rice, that it's pretty amazing in, uh, in an American democracy, we actually do not know what the composition of the electorate looks like. Pre-election polls will differ significantly from the exit polls, which will differ significantly from post-election polls, which will differ, differ significantly from academic polls, like the National Election Survey, which will differ significantly from, uh, from US Census data that will, that will come out in uh, spring or early summer following an election year. So we'll get data in 20 and 21. So, um, you know, the fact is we do not know what the composition of the electorate is gonna be, as Lana pointed out, but the fact is even after the fact, we don't often know what the share of the, of the, electorate, of the electorate was. Um, and what makes many of those state misses especially concerning is we sort of figured out that we didn't have enough non-college educated whites in these Midwest battleground states, and that was fixed. And even though that was fixed, these states were um, were still wrong. So let's take a quick look at take a quick look at um, uh, my former home home state of of Wisconsin. Um, and as I as I as I mentioned, I look at I look at politics and I look at polling by trying to get the share of the electorate right and the performance of the electorate right. And you can look at share in a number of different variables. Um, probably the easiest one and the one that most people in politics look is the partisan composition of the um, of the electorate. And one thing that was very interesting to me over the course of the campaign was that um, for for Obama to have, excuse me for Biden to have between an eight and twelve percentage point lead and sometimes higher in uh, in national polls in um, in in October the Democratic advantage in party ID never got particularly large. So when Barack Obama was winning winning the national popular vote by about seven and a half percentage points in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in 2008, Democrats had about a seven or eight percentage point advantage in party ID and Obama won the votes of, um, of independents. So we were seeing in the polls a Biden lead similar to what Obama won by and often exceeding what Obama won by but we were not seeing a similar advantage in the partisan composition of the electorate, which tells you one of two things were happening. Either Republicans were massively voting for Biden, or not massively, but, but, but voting for Biden more than you would expect. That didn't happen. Um, or that independents were going uh, strongly for, uh, for, for Biden. And that was what was happening in, uh, in many of these national polls. And Wisconsin sort of a good example of that interaction between composition and party ID. So there were some polls in Wisconsin that had the race in the zero to five percentage point range. And so Charles Franklin at Marquette, um, a very high quality poll, had the race at four or five percentage point. He had that at even party ID. Actually, Republicans might have even been up a little bit um, and a slight lead for Biden with independence, which gave Biden a, a, a small lead. Those polls, and I haven't looked at, um, I, I think Darren did a poll in Wisconsin, I haven't looked at his internals, but other polls in that five to 10 range um, showed even party ID, but Biden doing much better with independence. And those polls that showed 
Democrats with a much bigger lead or Biden with a much bigger lead in Wisconsin, over 10 percentage points, showed a Democrat, Democratic advantage in party ID and Biden strongly winning, winning independence. So listen, as both Darren and Alana said, we don't know the answer for why the polls were wrong, but I think it's something in, in the interaction of partisanships, partisanship and independence. Independence we, is, a, is a profoundly messy category. Some of those people actually are independents or swing voters. Some of those people are not going to actually vote. And some of them are hidden partisans. Uh, and so your party ID number can vary whether independents will identify themselves as Republicans or, or Democrats. One example of this is in, uh, in, uh, in 2010, time of the Tea Party. You had lots of Tea Party people not identifying themselves as Republican. I'm Tea Party. I'm not, I'm not in favor of any political party, but they were clearly Republican voters and voted like Republican voters. So I think, uh, uh, and this is just the speculation, that the mistakes that we saw in the national polling and the mistakes that we certainly saw in, 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 in places, like, uh, places like Wisconsin, places like Ohio, places like Pennsylvania, have to do with some non-response, as Lana said, but non-response among Republican-leaning uh, independents. Um, I'm not convinced that there was massive non-response among Republicans because we were still seeing uh, many national polls and many state polls with Republicans' uh, party identification about as strong as it's ever been and about as narrow as it's ever been in um, in uh, in uh, in many of these uh, in many of these states. Um, so that's just one thought or one speculation about what could be going on here, and would love to hear from my panelists and happy to answer happy to answer any questions. Two other quick thoughts. Um, you know, we can discuss about what the role of polling is, um, and I am not an apologist for for the for the state of polling uh, and how the media uses polling. There were clearly mistakes. The question is, did that matter? Did that influence the outcome in uh, in uh, in any way, shape, or form? And I'm a little bit skeptical of that. And then the big question is, are we facing problems here that are um, uh, systemic to to polling, or does it have to do more with um, with Donald Trump being on the uh, on the uh, on the ballot? So, uh, thanks again to, uh, to 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 Mark for uh, for having me here, and great to be with everybody. Okay, well, thank you, Ken. Uh, so, three great presentations. I appreciate the. I think you gave all gave us a really a lot to think about, as well as a really nice overview of what occurred, what the problems are, and what are some of the potential explanations for what we found. So I guess I wanna just start off, we have a lot of questions from the audience. I wanna start off with one that focuses on issue that Ken ended up with. That is how much of this is Donald Trump, uh, both, and that could be Donald Trump in terms of affecting how voters view polls, affecting turnout, uh, you know, or is it something else? You know, For instance, is it, Jim Harbaugh causing problems in the upper Midwest. And you know, once he leaves Michigan and stops the misery, we'll be all good. So is this a Trump factor? How much of this is Trump? How much of it is not Trump? Uh, I'll take a whack at that. Um, you know, for, uh, for years, Ken and, and Lana and Mark, I know you are familiar with the kind of literature that developed after 2000 about the emerging democratic majority. We're all waiting for the Hispanic population, to a lesser extent, the burgeoning Asian population, these young voters to, to come to dominate the electorate, and they were going to herald in this new age of, of democratic dominance, or at least ascendance. And uh, in 2016, um, it's not that that was wrong. I mean, that, that, that sort of continues apace, but we really were blindsided by the identification and registration of less well-educated white voters, especially in these upper Midwest states. Um, I don't know that anybody really saw that coming. And, and to the extent that the, the Trump campaign deserves credit for being strategically you know, intelligent, it would be Parscale and others who saw these voters and got them on the map in, in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania and these other states. It was a sort of a coalitional offset that we didn't really see coming. And I'm not, I'm not saying that the Democrats don't have sort of more juice to be gained from mobilizing their coalition compared to the Republicans, but um, that really caught all of us. I don't know that any of us saw that coming. 
Um, and, and the question then is, uh, how many more of these voters are out there? How durable a part of party politics are these voters? Are, are they kind of Trump's property? Um, and they're not going to be interested in, in voting for sort of a more standard Republican candidate? Or are, are they now, you know, people at the party who, who are going to be courted and, 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 and you know, wined and dined and, and Republicans are going to have to mobilize them if they're going to be competitive in some of these places? Um, and that is the million dollar question, right? I mean, wh what do we make of these voters? Are, are they here to stay? And, and the other sort of more, you know, nerdy question to use Ken's word is, how many more of them are out there? I mean, we, we still do these interesting calculations about the number of unregistered African American voters in places like North Carolina and Georgia. I think we need to start thinking about the number of un, you know unregistered or underregistered lower status whites are in some of these upper Midwest states. I, I think we saw the Sun Belt moving to center, you know, more to the center in the last few election cycles. I'm surprised at the extent to which these upper Midwest states have have kind of done the same thing. I think we all sort of assumed they were lost for the Republicans, at least at the presidential level. I don't think that's true anymore. But I remain, you know, I, I'm, I'm like you guys, I'm waiting to see what do these people do? And how committed are they to a politics beyond Trump? Yeah, well, thanks, Darren. So I, there, a second question, this like, this, uh, this essentially is asked by different people with the question going two different ways. One is, to what extent did the pre-election polls affect voting behavior? And there's and we have different questions going different ways. One question is that it caused Republicans to not turn out, be, uh, at least our Trump voters to not turn out because they thought the election was lost. The other side would be that it caused Democratic voters to not turn out because they thought the election was won. What's your view of either of those hypotheses uh, that have been posited in different questions? You know, we had the highest turnout ever. We had 153 million people turn out. It's, it's hard to imagine that a lot of people were turned off by the polls in terms of turning out. It just, just doesn't seem that likely. I don't think there's, there, there is certainly some evidence in the literature that, you know, polls can have these negative effects. Um, but it is not, it, it is not, they're really actually very old studies. And, and I, I don't think it's very likely. I mean, voting is a very habitual thing. Um, and in a presidential ele election, there's just a lot of reason to come out. There's so much information, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm, there's a lot happening. So I think that's really possible in sort of a governor poll or, or a, a, a Senate race in an off year election. But in a presidential election, there's just too much mobilization for the polls to be a big deciding factor. We had, we had a Fox question where we asked people who they thought was going to win. And we saw, you know, Trump consistently led in that question across the election cycle until fairly deep into September when Biden finally caught up and more people said they thought Biden was going to win. But the percentage of Republicans who thought Trump was going to win was was in excess of 70 or 80 percent. So I'm, I'm kind of with with Lana on this. I see absolutely zero evidence that affected Democratic turnout. Um, and, you know, I, I think the question of Republican turnout was the question going into this election. And I think Trump got his people there. Uh, and, and there isn't much evidence that the, the polls cost him anywhere. Um, you know, we couldn't find evidence in direct answers to questions, nor in the aggregate evidence with respect to turnout. One other way of looking at that, and again, I don't think any of us want to be apologists for the state of the po of polling and always think that the media could do um, sometimes a better job of, uh, of, of putting things in, in context. But um, if polls and expectations about outcomes matter, zero people would have voted in California. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, the fact, the fact of the matter is in, you know, we can debate whether it was, you know, 35 or 40 states, the outcome was absolutely not in doubt. And many of those states, Biden was winning, you know, you didn't need a poll to know that Biden was going to win, was going to win California. So if expectations about who the winner was going to be caused people not to vote, then no one should have voted in, um, in, uh, in California, including Republicans, right? Which state, and I think it's probably a function of Texas becoming a little bit more competitive, which state will Donald Trump get the most votes in? California, just because it's a very, a very, a very large state. Another interesting thing, and maybe ties it a little bit to the Baker Institute in, um, in uh, 
in the 2000 election, um, the networks called Florida for Al Gore, not at poll closing time, um, but very close to poll closing time around eight o'clock Eastern when some precincts in the Florida panhandle were still open. Um, and, uh, and Secretary Baker, who there's not a better campaign manager around, and uh, for all of you who, who saw the movie, right, took the lead on the, on the efforts of the George W. Bush campaign um, in, uh, and I know Darren was involved in this a little bit, they desperately tried to find one person in the panhandle to sign an affidavit saying they didn't vote because they saw the network call of Al Gore. And um, and uh, and couldn't find that. So there is really scant evidence that the polls influence what is habitual behavior. To Lana's point. All right. Thanks. And so, okay, this next question comes from a pollster colleague who, sort of, I think, you know, has a couple of questions. But I think one would come down to some of the things that Ken was bringing up in terms of turnout and partisanship, and that is in terms of how we report poll results. And the question should be, should we, instead of providing one result, should there be more focus on different scenarios? That is, if turnout is this, if this group turns out at this rate, uh, sort of providing more options, or will that cloud things further? I've, <laughs> I, I actually, I understand the point. I think in a perfect world, it would be wonderful. Um, but if, if I were a, a sponsor of a poll, if I were, ABC or, or CNN or Fox, and someone came to me and says, well, under this scenario, Biden wins. But under this scenario, Trump wins. Um, and under this scenario, he wins by a lot. And under this scenario, he wins by, I, I'd kind of wonder, so you're telling me anything could happen. And I paid how much money for this particular survey? I also think it undermines the confidence. Let, let's, let's be clear. There was an interesting article by Andrew Gelman, um, who's a fabulous political scientist, uh, basically sort of saying, we don't need, what are we doing with these polls? Um, and I, I think, I, I certainly understand that, the, the obsession forecast that the polls do, which let's, let's be honest, that's why media entities largely like these things is that they're, you know, they're predictions, um, more or less accurate, but they're predictions. But they have another role, and that is for cable organizations in particular, newspapers, they drive stories. It's not just the top line, it's the story, it's the COVID, the economy, the healthcare, all the other data in the poll. And when you present multiple results off the ballot test, it tends to erode people's confidence in the point estimates for other aspects of the poll. And I know it's, it's sort of an in the, you know, in the weeds point, but um, you know, if I'm gonna do that, do I then need to say, well, under this scenario, 60% of people approve of uh, you know, Biden's response to COVID. And under this scenario, it's 53%. I mean, the media want no part of that. So. If we're talking about a universe in which the media are the primary sponsors for these high quality polls, and I still think we're kind of in that universe, um, I, I think it's kind of tough to do that. Um, I'm also, by the way, the, the question of likely voters and, and turnout dynamics, it, it is a big deal, but I think the focus on the likely voter screen as opposed to the weighting of the poll is, is a big deal. We have a very, very light touch at Fox. Our sort of approach is if you sit down and do a 15 minute poll with a live interviewer on telephone, guess what? You're a likely voter, right? I mean, that's, you know, there are very few people left in America who take that call, sit down, talk for 15 minutes and then go, yeah, I'm not that interested in politics. I mean, maybe in the Midwest where there's really, really polite people or, um, you know, in East Texas maybe, but uh, you know, I, 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 we have lighter and lighter touches and we, we screen fewer and fewer people out because our assumption is, is that the kinds of people that are actually doing these polls are, are almost certainly going to vote. And by the way, that's manifest in their responses to the attitudinal questions. Like how likely are you to vote? Zero to 10. Almost all of our sample says they're tens. Almost all the sample says they're very interested in the election. And I don't think that's people exaggerating. I think that's just kind of, that, that's a function of the samples. So, so I, I, I get I get the ask. I think more information is better. I think greater humility on the part of explaining what we're doing. And, you know, we always talk about a snapshot in time and margin of error. That's not just CYA. That's true. Um, I think if we did a better job of sort of presenting that, maybe it would get to the point that I, I probably, Professor Stein, I would imagine, is the uh, <laughs> person that, 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 that particular question along. <laughs> I disagree with Darren on that. I think that um, I think that news organizations 
could do a better job. Listen, whenever I do a poll that's, uh, that's not for, for external release, um, I would give a client a, a range of possible outcomes and a lot of the value I'm providing is, is, is explaining to them some of those um, some of those assumptions. Um, I do agree too much is made of, of, of the likely voter screen. Once someone's done the poll, right? If someone's doing the poll, they're gonna vote. Um, and you know, in terms of you know, having different point estimates or more transparency in the internals of the poll, eroding people's confidence, well, I'm not sure, I mean, for those of you who are calculus fans, I think we're up against the limit of eroding people's confidence in polls. So I'm not sure it's gonna erode people's confidence, confidence anymore. But I think a survey that, how many publicly released surveys show you their unweighted demographic composition, their weighted demographic composition, and how each important subgroup performed? Very, very few. Um, and that would uh, and that would be a, a strong step forward towards uh, towards transparency, I think. Yeah, my point wasn't about transparency. It was about providing multiple estimates, which I think have, you know, to just push back against Ken, they have all the problems times however many you run. You know, I mean, I, I can show you, you know, the, at Fox, we present all the results by subgroups up until about, I think if it's under 100 points. And the reason we don't is that under under 100 respondents is because those have such significant errors associated with them. It's, it's not productive to have talent or reporters out there saying, well, you know, amongst left-handed Albanians, you know, we find that Biden has a 25 point lead because the next poll, uh, you know, those 25 respondents in the next survey are gonna be 50 points for Trump because it's just so unstable. So um, I, I absolutely agree with transparency. You know, I, I'm probably wrong on offering multiple point estimates. I just find it a little frustrating. So hey, I'd like to, oh, go ahead, Lana. Well, I, I just wanted to take off of, of something that Darren said about how people who you, you do contact when you, you know, they're talking on the phone to you, they're likely voters. I think that's really true. But I think, you know, what the, we're worried about is the people who are who are not responding. And what I see in my own data in 2020 is, and I did a pre-election and a post-election survey is I, I knew who voted early. And so I, I find a real enthusiasm. People who voted early are responding at 20%. People who voted election day are responding at, you know, like 0.03%, you know, or 3%. So I'm seeing really a difference in how enthusiasm affects response. And I'm seeing that enthusiastic Democrats, you know, are just off the charts responding. And enthusiastic Republicans who are in that same early voting period are not responding to me at the same rate. So it's really about, you know, it's about those non-responders uh, getting them into the survey that's the problem. And I guess the, the, the follow-up question that comes from one of the viewers is then how do you get to those? Like what, what's, the, what's the route to try to get rid of some of this non-response problem? It's really tricky. We've, we've, you know, with the National Election Survey, which I'm involved with right now, we have the luxury of offering incentives. Um, and, and, you know, we have continual discussions about um, the pace and level of escalation, as we call it. And that is, we, we typically um, offer people recompense for participating in this face-to-face -face interviews. Um, if they refuse, you know, we will escalate the, well, what if we give you this? And what if we give you this? I think people, I don't want to get the wrong idea. We're not talking about just, you know, off, putting a $5 bill up and having people come to want to do the survey. They have been randomly selected. So the, the question is, we want them, we want their interview. How much, you know, do we have to offer to get them to do that? Um, Pew has done some really interesting studies where they've done sort of a traditional Pew study. Um, and then they've had kind of the deluxe version to see if they can increase their response rates. And then they compare their sort of low response, typical Pew survey results with what they get. I believe they've gotten up into the high 20s in terms of, uh, maybe not that high, but close to 20% um, response rates. And what they find is that the real difference isn't in terms of partisanship, the real difference is in interest and engagement with politics. So what we're getting with our low response rates in our media polls right now is a real overrepresentation of the extent to which Americans are interested, engaged, and knowledgeable about politics. And that that hasn't bothered us much, Lana and Ken, you know, we sort of use these results and we find them pretty plausible. But I'm wondering if we're beginning to reach a point of no return where that 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 skew with respect to interest and engagement 
is beginning to, to systematically skew our understanding of not just elections, but also uh, public opinion across these issues. I, the last couple of years, I'm not so sure that the Pew study, which I've been citing, you know, you know, ad nauseum over the past five years, I'm not sure how much I believe that anymore. The, the waiting is, you know, becomes really critical. And if we're not waiting on the right thing, a lot of pollsters wait on party ID. I think that's really important now. But I think we need to be thinking about waiting possibly on factors like interest and enthusiasm. And, you know, that's where we're not, that, that's where we are losing people. And if those people are somehow different, um, then that's a huge problem for our surveys. And we don't know if they're different yet. And I mean, is enthusiasm, yeah. you know, does that prevent us from predicting? Um, only, you know, only if there are different numbers of enthusiasts who, and they're not participating at the same rate. So, um, but, but, but it may be that we need to think about waiting on different attitudes, which we haven't really done before, except for partisanship. Yeah. We, we that's, that, that's a really interesting topic. And of course, Captain Obvious, the big, the big problem with studying non-response is people don't respond, right? And so maybe you can do some work with, with, with voter files to try and get some information about the people who are, who are, who are not responding to you. Um, and I do think we want to look at creative ways of waiting, but you can't wait yourself out of, uh, out of non-response if the subgroups who are talking to you, you get their correct proportion, but they're different in their, in their, in their attitudes. Um, and you come back a little bit to, to the non-college educated whites in the Midwest. Um, you know, I do think that that was something that people were intensely focused on in, in, this, um, in this election. And you could look at um, non-voters and non-voters in places like New Mexico and Texas um, and Florida and North Carolina and Georgia, people who hadn't voted previously were more likely to be, were more likely to be non-white. But if you look at states like Wisconsin and Ohio and Pennsylvania and Michigan, people who had not voted, pre who had not voted previously were more likely to be non-college educated whites. And back to our point about um, voting being habitual, non-voting was also um, habitual. So those people, we never worried about not interviewing them because they didn't want to be interviewed, but something brought them, brought them out this, um, this time. So I do think um, a continued focus on the sorts of people, um, I, and, and it could be a focus on non-college educated whites and the variance in non-college educated whites in some of these states, not only in getting the correct number, uh, and I think in general, we did get the correct number or proportion of them in many of these states, but we didn't get the random pull of those people. So we underestimated Republican support, Trump support among those folks. I think we have time for one final question. So I wanted to drill down we've been talking about the presidential race but the polls and i think as ken mentioned cook political report was pretty off this cycle uh what happened at the congressional level both senate and u.s house why was democratic performance far worse than expected uh, not, well we'll see with the senate but i think particularly with the house that is i don't think anyone in, in the d triple c or elsewhere thought that the democratic party was going to lose seats let alone what looks like about 10 seats what happened there yeah, I, I think, well, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky because the number of high quality district wide polls uh, that exist across an election cycle, I could probably count on two hands. Um, you know, it's, it's just not something we, we do a lot of. Almost all the high quality polling is, is done by the parties and by candidates. Um, you know, I, I thought, it, you know, this gets to one of the explanations, which is, it just feels right, but I, I just can't find much evidence for. And that's this notion of a shy Trump voter. Right. If it were all a shy Trump voter, I don't know about you, but I don't know many, many shy Susan Collins voters. Right. Who are just so socially embarrassed by uh, articulating their support for Susan Collins. Right. But Collins was underestimated dramatically in Maine. Um, and, and you saw that in these Senate candidates, too. I mean, look at uh, look at Tillis in North Carolina. Uh, look at Cornyn in Texas. You know, it it. it so while I'm, I'm still open to this notion of a shy Trump voter we've been looking really hard for because such an obvious and appealing explanation it's it's got to be right at some level but we're really having a hard time finding concrete evidence for it um I think turnout you know I, I wrote a book with John Petrosic recently oh I happen to have it right here 
called the Torah myth. <laughs> um, the central argument of which is that there's no consistent partisan vote choice um, effect of high or low turnout. Um, that's not to say that Democrats don't dominate in some high turnout elections or, Republic, or Republicans do well in some low turnout elections. There's nothing systematic about turnout. Um, what happens is you tend to bring in a high turnout election, you bring peripheral voters to the table. And peripheral voters are, are essentially not terribly partisan. They tend to blow with the political wind. And so what happens in a high turnout election is whichever party has the wind at their backs does well. And, and so it's, it's and, and I think it, you know, the conventional wisdom about Democrats doing well in high turnout elections really kind of got into our minds in this election cycle. I, I think, Mark, the answer to your question is, is that Republicans did a really good job of getting their voters there on election day. Um, and that to me was interestingly high Democratic turnout. I mean, Ken and Lana, we saw this, and Mark, you saw, we knew the Democrats were going to show up. I mean, unless they, you know, didn't know how to mail in a ballot or there were other sort of COVID related explanations, they were there. The question was, and especially in a state like Texas, was there sufficient enthusiasm for Trump to motivate West Texas Republicans to go and vote in these races or in the in District 23 or in uh, Districts 39, 45, 49 out in California? You know, were you going to get sufficient Republican enthusiasm? And there was. Um, I, I actually think at the House level, the turnout story is more important in a lot of ways than perhaps it was nationally. Um, but I think the real question was, could Republicans get their people, you know, to go vote in these races, especially as Ken mentioned, in states that weren't all that competitive. And, and it looks like they did. I think in some ways they learned a lesson from 2018, too, um, about the need to do that and how to do that. So anyway, that's, that's my thought about the House races. Okay, well, thank you. I think we're, we're, we hit our time cap. Uh, so Lana, Ken, Darren, I want to thank you. And to our audience, I want to thank you all. I'm going to turn it over to John Williams to give us some final thoughts. Fellas, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and observations. It was quite a joy. We'll now take a short break and resume with the next panel at 12.30 p.m. Central Time. But in the meantime, please tell your friends and colleagues that they can watch this program by going to www.bakerinstitute.org, www.bakerinstitute.org. See you soon.